Um, uh, thankfully, my... Well, OK, so I'm Miles Johnson. I'm the Senior Historic Environment Officer for the Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority. Um, until a couple of years ago, I worked as a countryside archaeological advisor. Um, so my specific role was to do with providing uh, advice on the management of a uh, rural historic environment. And a lot of that entailed, in, in, in probably the last 10 years, entailed uh, advice into modern restoration schemes. So, so there really is quite a lot of uh, overlap. That said, there, there's also some significant differences. To give a little bit of context, um, I'm just going to run through a couple of slides um, with some tasters of the kind of archaeology that uh, uh, I deal with and dealt with uh, in my countryside advisor role. So um, the circular enclosure you can see there is actually overlaid by part of a coaxial field system. We think the uh, enclosure is potentially Neolithic. There are dozens, potentially hundreds of square kilometres even, of coaxial enclosure systems in the Yorkshire Dales. Uh, really quite a um, significant part of uh, our historic environment. Not particularly tangible one, uh, whereas some of the industrial remains we have are rather more um, easy to appreciate from the, uh, from the public perspective. So uh, on the left-hand side, um, uh, that's a, a shot of uh, part of uh, the west side of Arkham Garthdale, uh, where there's a very um, extensive uh, lead mining landscape, um, including hushing, shaft mining, areas of dressing floors, uh, and you can perhaps also see that there's, there's numerous dams uh, on there. A really large part of that uh, landscape is about water management. Right hand side uh, is actually Grassington Moor and the south part of the National Park. Uh, uh, a really uh, significant, very large um, early 19th century uh, uh, shaft mine on Grassington Moor, uh, and just a, a, an example of a, a, a lead mine adit, a drainage feature. So, a lot of those features uh, lie on, uh, uh, on managed grass moors. Uh, quite often there are varying depths of peat. Sometimes uh, we get deep peat. Sometimes we have very shallow peat, um, which generally at the towards the base of peat is, is actually where we find quite a lot of prehistoric activity. Um, uh, I don't know how well you can see this, but interesting. Sometimes on the, on the interface of peat and the limestone, we get hints that there are earthworks actually disappearing uh, underneath the peat. Perhaps an example of uh, some deeper peat. Um, here we've got uh, uh, a very eroded deep blanket peat, um, potentially caused by more than fire uh, in, the, in the 60s, 70s. Uh, you can see some causeways on there. That's actually one of our mining landscapes at Tan Hill, a uh, coal mining landscape. Once the peat starts to erode, it's actually very difficult when it gets that bad to, to regenerate peat. So the Moreland Restoration Surveys, uh, Moreland Restoration Projects, uh, do things like uh, they will try and uh, reintroduce uh, heather brushings, uh, and they can sometimes uh, uh, they will seek to transfer uh, sphagnum moss, re-established moss onto site once it's wet enough. Sometimes it's actually a, gr a grass nurse crop that they need to put on. Uh, in order to do that, you actually need to reduce the acidity of the peat. Uh, in that case, that actually means lining the surface of the peat. So in environmental terms, that's quite an interesting one. Um, that said, for, for, for a site like that, the, the, the peat is, is essentially so eroded, it's, it's like become a dune system. So you have... Um, uh, peat that washes away in winter um, when it dries out in summer actually becomes very mobile and moves. So kind of quite different kinds of, um, uh, of moorland problems than, than, than say Martin was talking about next year. Um, we also have thousands of miles of uh, moorland drains, they're called grips in the Yorkshire Dales uh, and, and probably a significant percentage of those have been, been blocked. Uh, generally it's done by a a trapped excavator straddling the grip, taking a little bite out one side and putting the peat plug in. All of these projects, or I wouldn't say all of these, the, the vast majority of these projects we've had archaeological input into. Um, uh, and depending on the potential of the area, we, we request prior survey and we would tend to 
it would tend to be a very basic survey because it's you know the purpose of the project is is not uh, the historic environment, but we we have certainly enhanced the information we've made on northern areas through that. Um, the so what we tend to try and get the contractors to do is to actually theme the archaeology by its vulnerability to certain kinds of activity to the restoration different restoration actions involved. So. And we do that very simply, so it might be a red, amber, green in terms of machine access, or, or actually where, where would we be concerned about uh, a machine actually taking uh, heat to, to plug grips from? Uh, and so uh, a, a red area would be an exclusion zone, a green area would be fine, and an amber area, well, that might require some, uh, some further archaeological mitigation. <coughs> in order to do these projects, is hellishly complicated because uh, a lot of the time they're, they're managed grouse moors, which means that there's a, a vested interest in, uh, uh, in, in access to the moor at certain times of the year. You have uh, people with guns, so <laughs> you want to be slightly careful. Um, uh, but we, we need to fit around the, that, the shooting activity. Quite a lot of them are also common land. Uh, uh, and actually, if you're doing intrusive work, actually you can need uh, uh, consent from Secretary of State to do that. Um, uh, and a lot of them are also triple SIs. So we're talking about multiple complicated designations um, uh, and, and uh, a lot of negotiation in order to make those projects work. So uh, in, in Yorkshire, uh, there's been an organisation run out of Yorkshire Wildlife Trust called the Yorkshire Peat Partnership, and we work very closely with them. Um, right, that's the peat bit done. I didn't want to duplicate too much of uh, Martin's talk. Um, apologies, this is slightly out of date map because the Yorkshire Dales National Park is not that shape anymore. Uh, it's slightly larger as of uh, August 2016. Um, but I want to talk a bit about the, the context uh, with which we, we get funding and uh, can manage the historic environment successfully. Um, uh, versus the resources available for, uh, for example, natural environment. So this is just a map that shows distribution of scheduled monuments against triple SIs, and admittedly, it's against the old national park. So there are actually now 295 scheduled monuments in the Yorkshire Dales, and as, uh, as opposed to 200 a couple of years back. And actually, that makes a real difference to what we can achieve on, on some of those sites. Uh, that's the national park as is now, which I'm absolutely delighted about. We've got some fabulous bit in East Cumbria. That's some of the best archaeology. Okay. And actually, that, that number is, it really is significant. Um, and I suppose, really, it is part of the numbers game that a lot of us have to, to play. Um, so uh, I don't know if you can read that, but actually, the, the number of scheduled monuments is, is reported each year and is used as part of the basis for the, the funding of different national park authorities. So national park authorities are rated against one another in terms of their environmental assets, and that actually fundamentally impacts how much money you have to spend. Um, and also, that number means things to people like our members as well. Um, so, and, 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 and in general terms, they don't necessarily understand the vagaries. And it is the number it's not the area that's scheduled or the number of constraint areas, it's the number, whatever that means. Um, give you uh, an example from part of the limestone uh, Craven Dales. Um, my apologies for the, the light on this. Uh, the, the photo contains really quite complicated landscape with. Uh, probably later prehistoric to Ramada British coaxial field systems, overlain by probably really quite early lead mining, um, and uh, little enclosures, and right in the bottom there is a round barrow excavated in the late 19th century, and that bit's the shed of one thing, and the rest isn't. The rest is also part of a uh, grassland uh, species which grass and triple SI. And again, we work quite hard uh, in, in advising on high level stewardship agreements, countryside stewardship agreements. Um, but 
the, the whip hand isn't, isn't with the historic environment there. One way we've tried to address that is through um, drafting a series of um, premier archaeological landscapes that's been done in Exmoor and Dartmoor. We haven't actually formalised these yet, but um, before my boss Robert retired in 2016, he and I went through a, a, an exercise in, in drawing some draft pals, which we will um, actually consult on through our Yorkshire's Historic Environment Group. Uh, and, and we hope to adopt at some point in the next year or two. And the other thing, obviously, we'll have to do is uh, extend that to cover the, the new area of the National Park. Um, to move on, again, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about lead mining, which is actually um, one of the special qualities of the uh, <coughs> historic environment of the National Park. So uh, part of our core purpose is to conserve and enhance the special qualities of the National Park. And, Industrial heritage, in particular, the uh, mining heritage is listed as that. Uh, this again, um, moss shaft on Grassington Moor, uh, uh, early 19th century deep mine shaft. Um, uh, Grassington Moor is like a, a, a big dome, so there's very few places to put addicts in. Um, uh, on the top side of the picture, you can see uh, what was quite a large dressing floor, but it's actually very disturbed. <coughs> Aside of the historic interest, these sites are actually also quite important for their botanical interest. The, um, the dressing waste is quite toxic and, and doesn't vegetate very readily, um, but when it does, uh, it, it gets quite rare plant communities, such as spring sandwort, which is shown in this photo. The reason, um, about 10 years ago, uh, a significant part of Robertson and, and my work uh, and a really big area of concern for us was that these sites, particularly ones that fell onto uh, shooting estates, were being used as sources of aggregate to uh, improve the infrastructure related to shooting, principally trackways, but also things like grass ruts. Um, uh, and this had gone on for a, a long time, and it's quite understandable because it's not really being used by anybody else, and to uh, uh, an estate it's a uh, it's a, a, a free source of aggregate and quite quite useful, readily available, portable if you've got the machine like that. Um, but actually, technically, it's not very good for creating trackways. Um, uh, and, and one of the impacts is that it, it washes away quite quickly. And that has a, a wider impact. And in fact, one of the legacies that we're now starting to become aware of with the lead industry in the, in the Yorkshire Dales is, is one of water pollution. Um, so in the, last, uh, uh, in the last few months, we've been in discussions with the Environment Agency. Um, and that's because uh, water courses like the Air and the Swale and the Nid, which is actually outside the Dales, but has the same issues, uh, a, a, a failing in terms of the uh, metalliferous contaminants they have, um, uh, sometimes in the order of 50 times. Um, so it's actually a really quite serious issue. Now the Environment Agency are um, involved in a, a, in a, in a bid called Tees Swale, uh, which is a national scale heritage lottery fund bid. Um, and one aspect of that uh, is to actually start to try and tackle sometimes point source pollution but some of the diffuse pollution that comes from these sites. Uh, I should say also the, the tracks issue, we've actually, Robert and I made quite significant progress on that. We wrote to uh, all shooting estates um, uh, about eight years ago, ten years ago, um, and we, we took a paper to, to our planning authority um, which made clear that we weren't We've been turning a blind eye to this issue for too long. Um, so um, in, we require notification under the GPDO, uh, General Permitted Development Order, uh, of, any, of any use of mineral spoil. Um, and where, where that's happened, we tended to require planning permission. So this issue with, uh, uh, with, with uh, mines, with pollution from mine sites actually uh, 
basically relates to all aspects of lead mining. If you think about it, actually water is involved in, in dressing, uh, in extraction, and actually in the smelting uh, of ore uh, for power, but also for drainage and also separation of ore. Um, and that's a quick example of uh, uh, a smelt mill, uh, old gang. I want to finish uh, with this particular slide again, which shows the, um, some of the, the dams in Arkengarth Dale. Um, and, and actually, briefly mention another idea, one of the other things that the uplands are uh, thought to be potential, have, have great potential for is actually to, to uh, reduce runoff and reduce flashiness. Um, these, these dams are mostly 18th and 19th century. They actually have potential to be reused to attenuate uh, water flow and reduce flashiness. Um, so uh, that's kind of one of the interesting things I hope to be looking at in the next few years. Thank you.